this last section, we'll be talking about habit reversal training and medications for tic disorders. Now, when tic disorders become severe enough for these um, more aggressive sort of treatments, I'll usually consider three areas. That is if there's any physical discomfort, functional impairment, or social difficulties. I've explained it a little bit earlier, but the physical discomfort uh, can come in the form of things like sore jaws for mouth opening tics, maybe headaches for an eye blinking tic, muscle aches for other sort of movements. The functional impairments, difficulty reading from something like an eye blinking tic, uh, sports activities with an arm movement tic, and school problems, um, um, with, um, things like um, writing uh, or even disruption in the classroom. And then finally, social difficulties. Uh, this can be things like bullying or being self-conscious. Something important about the bullying and social uh, difficulties, I'll often talk to children um, specifically about this. I'll ask them, what's their response when people ask you about your tic disorder? We'll talk about two different groups of kids that'll ask you about your tic disorder. Nice kids or, or kids who are being bullies or teasing. For the children who are friends and, and, and just are curious in a non-threatening uh, sort of way, I'll often tell the kids to say, it's a habit, it's just something I do. Uh, or you could say something like, it's a tick, it's just something I, I do. And I find that's generally enough information uh, for kids, and I'll tell older kids you can go into it and explain it a little more if there's follow-up questions. But that's often a good place to start. It's a habit, it's just something I do. And then for bullies or people, you know, I'll say uh, uh, mean kids or people who want to tease you, they might be asking, you know, what's that weird thing you're doing all the time? Uh, often the best response for something like that is, it's none of your business or it's my business or mind your own business, something along those lines, rather than trying to explain the tick disorder to a bully or, or, or to try to um, escalate things, uh, just a simple, it's, it's my business or none of your business, something like that. Now, the first sort of treatment when some one of these criteria are met, uh, physical discomfort, functional, dis dis functional problems, uh, or social dif difficulties, is something called habit reversal training. Now, habit reversal training has four components to it. The first thing is you have to be able to recognize when your tick is coming on. So that's that premonitory urge that children will feel, what they describe often as an itch or some sort of tightness. Now, this is really demonstrates one of the first limitations of habit reversal training is that only about a third of the people who have tick disorders will report having a premonitory urge before every tick. Sometimes the ticks come from out of the blue with no warning. The second part of habit reversal training is having a competing response um, to the premonitory urge rather than following through with your tick. And this is an important thing. You don't want to just suppress your tick when you feel that premonitory urge. You don't just want to fight against it. Often people with tick disorders will say, well, then it just builds and builds. But you want to do some sort of competing movement. So for example, for something with a strong eye blinking tick, when you have that premonitory urge of an, uh, uh, needing to do an eye blinking tick, often a competing urge can be something like a, a chin tuck uh, or flaring of the nostrils or some other sort of competing uh, movement that'll retrain your brain uh, out of um, that repetitive sort of tick that you have. The problem here is that sometimes that competing movement can turn into a new tick, and then we do habit reversal training for that. So it's another one of the limitations uh, for habit reversal training. And then the third part of habit reversal training is uh, praise or rewards or some sort of positive reinforcement for periods where children are tick-free. So habit reversal training offers a nice treatment option before getting into uh, medications. So some important principles about medications is, first of all, you don't want to assume that medication is always necessary. The second thing is, maybe you treat the comorbid condition before necessarily doing a direct attack on the tick disorders. Complete tick remission is very rare with medication. It's usually um, not a goal that we have. We don't gauge uh, whether or not our medication is effective by complete remission. And just the last little caveat in, in treating tick disorders and their comorbidities is stimulant medications, uh, such as uh, medications for ADHD, are not necessarily contraindicated. Um, and they're usually safe to use for children with ticks. So the first class of medications, which I'll describe, not FDA approved, are a group called alpha-2 agonists. This is usually the class of medications that most doctors will start with. This includes guanfacine and clonidine. 
The good part about using these medications is there aren't a lot of side effects. Uh, sleepiness is the main one. Uh, Time-released guanfacine was recently FDA approved in children for treatment of ADHD, so it's been very well studied in, in children. Um, outside of those side effects, there's a few other things like dry mouth, it can lower your blood pressure, something called orthostatic hypotension when you stand up, feel a little bit light, lightheaded. A good place to start for treatment of ticks, not a lot of side effects to talk about. The next class of medication, stronger medication for ticks, again, not FDA approved, tend to be more effective, but along with that effectiveness comes some more serious side effects to talk about. This class of medication are atypical neuroleptic medications, including risperidone and olanzapine are probably the most common atypical neuroleptics to be used for children with tick disorders. Like I said, better medication for ticks, uh, usually more effective, the problem is can come along with side effects, some of the side effects which are irre irreversible. Um, some common side effects for this class of medications, sleepiness, increased appetite, uh, those are the more mild and more common side effects. Some of the more serious ones are unusual movements, maybe some tightness in the muscles, um, on into even bone marrow problems or uh, liver, liver problems. So for me, um, in deciding to use the stronger class of medications, children's ticks have to be pretty disabling. Now our FDA approved medications for tick disorders are typical neuroleptics, including pimazide and haloperidol. These are stronger medications um, which have the same sleepiness and increased appetite as the atypical neuroleptics. Can also cause those extra pyramidal side effects, those unusual uh, movements and possibly even some cardiac um, heart problems. These are medications which I reserve for very severe ticks. Uh, maybe less than three to five percent of children that I treat for tick disorders are on a typical neuro neuroleptic. It's a less commonly used medication for tick disorders. Another class of medications which I'll usually prescribe and, and never prescribe as a first-line medication are benzodiazepines. The most commonly used benzodiazepine for tick disorders is something like clonazepam. Um, again, it's a relatively safe medication as far as serious side effects go. It can cause things like uh, sleepiness. Um, it has the problems or concerns with things like addiction and tolerance. It's a medication, again, which I reserve for more serious tick disorders, usually used in combination with other medications. Now one of the basic principles of treating tick disorders is that often you don't treat the tick disorder itself, you treat the comorbid condition, the underlying problem in the ticks lesson. So a lot of times our treatments, medications and non-medical treatments are directed towards the comorbidities. If you remember anxiety disorders, including obsessive compulsive disorder, are the most common comorbidity or condition existing along with tick disorders. So we'll often use medications like SSRI medications, sertraline or fluoxetine. Sometimes we'll treat the ADHD, and so in an indirect way, we treat the ADHD, a child's anxiety may lessen, uh, and their ticks may lessen. Uh, this is one of the unusual situations where a child will come in with ticks, and they'll also have these very prominent ADHD symptoms, and I might prescribe something like a stimulant medication, or a non-stimulant medication for ADHD, something like atomoxetine, um, and then treating other sorts of behavioral and mood disorders in children may be an indirect way to treat tick disorders. Thank you for taking the time and watching our video. I hope it's provided you the information you need to help improve your child's quality of life. Please check back to the website regularly as we'll be frequently updating it with new information.